Remdesivir, everything you need to know. Hi everyone and welcome to a special edition of the Farm Easy Tutor. Today I'll be presenting a new drug spotlight on Remdesivir, an antiviral for the treatment of COVID-19 or the coronavirus. This will be a concise review that hopefully will provide you with everything you will need to know about Remdesivir. Remdesivir, also known as Vicluri, which is the trade name, is an antiviral drug. It's the first drug approved to treat COVID-19 infections. It's manufactured and distributed by Gilead Sciences. It was FDA approved in October of 2020, and it has activity against the SARS coronavirus 2. It's a nucleotide analog that inhibits the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of the virus, which is a mechanism that we will discuss shortly. Remdesivir is indicated for adults and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older and weighing at least 40 kilograms for the treatment of COVID-19 infections that require hospitalization. This slide describes remdesivir's mechanism of action. In subsequent slides, I'll illustrate how the drug works step by step so you'll understand this better. Remdesivir is a nucleotide analog. These nucleotide analogs are one of the oldest classes of antiviral drugs. Remdesivir inhibits viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, which is an enzyme that is essential for viral replication of the SARS coronavirus 2 virus. When the remdesivir nucleotide is substituted into the viral RNA template, viral RNA synthesis is inhibited. This results in delayed chain termination during the replication of the viral RNA. Let's first look to see how the coronavirus replicates itself inside the host cell. The coronavirus enters the patient's cell. It then releases viral RNA. Adenosine triphosphate or ATP is then incorporated into the viral RNA. And then translation of viral RNA by the RNA dependent RNA polymerase or RDRP occurs. What follows is RNA replication, where the virus makes copies of its RNA. Final assembly and release of the new virus then occurs. Now let's see how remdesivir prepares itself to get involved. Remdesivir first enters the patient's cell. And there's the chemical structure of remdesivir monophosphate, which is a prodrug. A prodrug means that it needs to be first metabolized to a pharmacologically active form before it can work. Remdesivir is then metabolized by esterase and kinase to form the pharmacologically active nucleotide metabolite remdesivir triphosphate, which is the active form. Remdesivir triphosphate structure closely resembles the RNA-based adenosine triphosphate, which we talked about earlier. Remdesivir is designed to mimic ATP to act as an adenosine analog. So let's put these two events together to see how remdesivir works. The coronavirus enters the patient's cell and releases its viral RNA. Remdesivir triphosphate competes with the natural adenosine triphosphate for incorporation into the growing RNA chains by the RNA polymerase. Remdesivir looks so similar to adenosine triphosphate that the RNA polymerase can unknowingly pick it up instead of the real adenosine and insert it into the strand of viral genome that's being constructed. So there you can see that remdesivir is incorporated into the RNA strand instead of adenosine. Remdesivir then blocks the RNA polymerase that the virus needs to replicate its genome and to proliferate in the host body. It inhibits RNA replication 
and thus RDRP is unable to make copies to incorporate RNA subunits. This results in premature termination of RNA replication and a failure to release new virus into the bloodstream. Remdesivir competes over the natural ATP base with the high selectivity, about 3.65 fold. Remdesivir triphosphate is a weak inhibitor of mammalian DNA and RNA polymerases, including human mitochondrial RNA polymerase. Now let's move along and talk about how to dose remdesivir. Patients not requiring invasive mechanical ventilation and or ECMO should be given a loading dose of 200 milligrams on day one, followed by 100 milligrams daily for four days, for a total of five days. If a patient does not demonstrate clinical improvement, then treatment may be extended for up to an additional five days. If the patient requires invasive mechanical ventilation and or ECMO, a loading dose of 200 milligrams should be given, followed by 100 milligrams daily for nine days for a total therapy of 10 days. Please make sure to monitor patients closely on remdesivir. Before starting remdesivir, we need to determine a glomerular filtration rate, perform hepatic lab tests such as ALT, AST, total bile, and ALKFOS, and determine the pro time. While receiving remdesivir, the patient should be monitored with these lab values as clinically appropriate. As far as dosage adjustments for remdesivir, in renal impairment, remdesivir is not recommended in patients who have a GFR of less than 30 ml per minute. The pharmacokinetics of remdesivir have not been evaluated in patients with renal impairment. And remdesivir contains an excipient called betadex sulfobutyl ether sodium, which is renally cleared and accumulates in decreased renal function. And it's not recommended to give this excipient in patients who have a glomerular filtration rate less than 30. The pharmacokinetics of remdesivir in liver impairment have not been evaluated, and so they, there are no recommendations for dosage adjustments. There are two main points to remember about remdesivir's pharmacokinetics. The first is that the drug is primarily eliminated by metabolism into two metabolites. The second point is that only 10% of the dose is eliminated in the urine and the half-life of the drug is one hour. An important drug interaction occurs when remdesivir is combined with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Co-administration of these drugs together is not recommended because in vitro, chloroquine has been found to antagonize the metabolic activation of remdesivir to its active triphosphate form, thus reducing its antiviral activity. As far as drug interactions, clinical drug-drug interaction studies have not been performed with remdesivir. In vitro drug interaction studies have found that remdesivir acts as a substrate for drug metabolizing enzymes. Remdesivir can also inhibit these enzymes as well, but the clinical relevance has yet to be determined. Some precautions when using remdesivir include monitoring for possible hypersensitivity reactions. These can occur either during or after the infusion of the drug. Slowing the infusion down can minimize this reaction. Another precaution is to monitor for transaminase elevations. They have been reported in both healthy volunteers and in patients with COVID-19 who receive remdesivir. In clinical trials, the incidence was similar in patients receiving either placebo or remdesivir. The transaminase elevations can occur as a clinical feature of the COVID-19 infection, so it's difficult to determine whether the remdesivir was causing it or it was due to the infection. Consider de-seeing the remdesivir if the ALT levels increase to greater than 10 times the upper limit of normal. 
and DC the drug if the ALT elevation is accompanied by signs or symptoms of liver inflammation. Make sure to perform hepatic lab testing in all patients before starting remdesivir and also while the patient is receiving the drug as therapy when clinically appropriate. Available data on the use of remdesivir in pregnant women are insufficient to evaluate for a drug-associated risk of major birth defects, miscarriage, or adverse maternal or fetal outcomes. There is no available data on the presence of remdesivir in human milk, the effects on the breastfed infant, or the effects on milk production. For special populations, pediatric use of remdesivir is currently limited to older than 12 years of age and weighing at least 40 kilograms. The FDA is conducting studies using remdesivir in pediatric patients younger than 12 years of age and less than 40 kilos in weight. There is no human experience of acute overdose with remdesivir, and there is no specific antidote. With regards to carcinogenesis and mutagenesis, studies to evaluate the carcinogenic potential of remdesivir have not been conducted. Now let's briefly talk about some pharmacy-specific issues, namely preparation and administration of the drug. To save time, I will highlight just the key points. Please refer to the package insert for more details. It is important to note that remdesivir is available as two different products, one as a lyophilized powder and two as a solution. The powder needs to be stored below 86 degrees Fahrenheit, while the solution requires refrigeration. Both dosage forms are available in 100 milligram strengths. When preparing the drug, aseptic technique should always be followed and the product should always be visually inspected. These products do not contain preservatives, so do not reuse or save reconstituted drug for future use. The instructions on this slide should be followed when you are using the powder vials. There is a lot of information on the slide, but the most important point is to reconstitute each vial with 19 ml of sterile water and shake the vial for 30 seconds until dissolved. There should be a vacuum pulling the water into the vial. You'll be adding the reconstituted remdesivir to a 100 or 250 ml bag of normal saline, but you need to first withdraw an equal volume of solution from the normal saline bag before adding the drug this is very important. After adding the remdesivir, gently invert the bag multiple times. Do not shake the bag. Stability is 24 hours at room temperature or 48 hours refrigerated. Here are instructions when you use the remdesivir solution. There is no need to reconstitute the drug. However, you still need to first withdraw an equal volume of solution from the normal saline bag before adding the drug. This is very important. Please note that the manufacturer only recommends using the 250 ml size of the normal saline bag. Follow with these steps. You will need to inject air into the remdesivir solution vial before withdrawing the solution. After adding the remdesivir to the bag, gently invert the bag multiple times. Do not shake the bag. Stability is 24 hours at room temperature or 48 hours refrigerated. Remdesivir should be administered as an IV infusion over 30 to 120 minutes. After the infusion is complete, it's a good idea to flush the line with 50 ml of normal saline to make sure all the drug has been delivered to the patient. This is more important to do if the infusion bag volume is 100 ml. The prepared diluted solution should not be administered simultaneously with any other medication. The compatibility of remdesivir injection with IV solutions and medications other than normal saline is not known. Here are the recommended rates of infusion depending on the infusion time and the volume of the infusion bag. 
So the main question is, does remdesivir work? Do the clinical studies support remdesivir as an effective treatment for COVID-19? The approval of remdesivir was based on three randomized trials. The ACTT1 trial, the simple severe trial, and the simple moderate trial. I will be reviewing each trial individually and then come up with a conclusion considering all three. The ACTT1 study was the largest of the three studies. It was sponsored by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. The final report was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on October 8th of 2020. The trial compared remdesivir for 10 days versus a placebo group. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial which was carried out at multiple international sites. The inclusion criteria stated that the patient can have either mild, moderate, or severe COVID-19. However, in the analysis, the majority of patients overall had severe disease, 90% of the patients. That means they qualified by having at least one of the following criteria listed in the blue box under severe disease. The demographic information is listed in the right column. And patients who receive remdesivir got the standard dose for a total of 10 days. The results of this study showed that remdesivir significantly shortened the time to recovery from 15 days to 10 days. This effect was largely observed in patients who entered the study in the severe disease category. In the overall patient population, there was a trend toward reduced mortality with remdesivir compared with placebo at day 29, but the data wasn't strong enough to definitively conclude any survival benefit. The benefit of remdesivir was most apparent in patients with a baseline ordinal score of 5 those receiving low flow oxygen. The second clinical study was called the Simple Severe Trial. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 2020. The trial compared remdesivir for five days versus 10 days. It was a randomized open label clinical trial carried out at multiple international sites. There was no control group and the randomization was not stratified. The inclusion criteria were patients who had severe COVID-19 infection and had an oxygen saturation of less than or equal to 94% on room air requiring oxygen and radiological evidence of pneumonia. Patients were excluded if they were on mechanical ventilation or ECMO at screening. One thing to note is that the 10-day group had more subjects at baseline that were more severe than the 5-day group. The 10-day group later required more mechanical ventilation or ECMO and more high-flow oxygen support. The demographic information is listed in the right column. And patients who received remdesivir got the standard dose for a total of either five or 10 days. The results of this clinical trial showed that in patients with severe COVID-19 not requiring mechanical ventilation, there was no significant difference in clinical status at day 14 between a five-day and a 10-day course of remdesivir. The 10-day group had a significantly higher percentage of patients in the more severe disease categories and worse clinical status than those in the five-day group. There was also a lack of randomized placebo control in this study, both of which may have skewed the results since results were adjusted for between-group differences at baseline. The all-cause mortality at day 8, 28 was between 12 and 14 percent, which was similar with the ACTT1 trial. The third clinical study was called the Simple Moderate Trial. This was published in JAMA in September of 2020. 
The trial compared three groups, remdesivir for five days, remdesivir for 10 days, and standard of care. It was a randomized open-label clinical trial carried out at multiple international sites. Randomization was not stratified. The inclusion criteria were patients with moderate COVID-19 infection. The criteria were oxygen saturation greater than 94% on room air and no supplemental oxygen and radiologic evidence of pneumonia. Excluded were patients on mechanical ventilation or ECMO. The demographic information is listed in the right column and patients who received remdesivir got the standard dose for a total of either five or 10 days. The results of this study showed that a five-day treatment course of remdesivir compared with standard of care resulted in a statistically improved clinical outcome on day 11. However, the odds of improvement in clinical status with a 10-day treatment of remdesivir compared to standard of care had a favorable trend but did not reach a level of statistical significance. One interesting point about this study was that it included data on patients who were taking hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine and patients on concomitant steroids. You can see that the percentage of patients on steroids was about 20%, but patients who were on concomitant hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine in the standard of care group was 45% compared to about 8 or 11% in the remdesivir groups. Here's my summary of the three clinical studies. Remdesivir showed a relatively modest benefit in clinical studies. It shortened the time to recovery from 15 to 10 days in the treatment of patients with severe COVID-19 infections. There was a trend toward reduced mortality with remdesivir compared with placebo, but it was not statistically significant. Patients who benefited the most with remdesivir were those who were receiving low flow oxygen as the drug may have prevented the progression to more severe respiratory disease. Treatment duration beyond five days of remdesivir did not appear to improve outcomes in severe COVID-19 patients who were not on mechanical ventilation or ECMO. And Gilead Sciences, the manufacturer of remdesivir, sponsored all three clinical trials with various degrees of financial support, drug supply, and participation in protocol development and implementation. The adverse effects of remdesivir in each of the three clinical trials were reported differently. Over the next few slides, I will quickly review them. The rate of serious adverse events in the ACTT1 trial were significantly higher in the placebo group compared to the remdesivir group. This was primarily driven by respiratory failure and the need for endotracheal intubation in placebo patients. The incidence of non-serious grade three or four adverse events were similar overall in the remdesivir and placebo groups. The most common adverse events were decreased glomerular filtration rate and decreased hemoglobin levels an increase in liver enzymes were more common in the placebo group. In the simple severe trial, rates of serious adverse events were more common in the 10-day group compared to the five-day group. This was primarily driven by reductions in creatinine clearance. Most of the patients in this group had been receiving invasive mechanical ventilation or high flow oxygen support at baseline. For non-serious ADEs, a higher percentage of events also occurred in the 10-day group compared to the five-day group, primarily lab abnormalities, which are mostly transient. In the simple moderate trial, serious adverse events were more common in the standard care group than in the remdesivir groups. For non-serious ADEs, events that were more common in the remdesivir group than in standard care included nausea, hypokalemia, and headache. And now the most important piece of information everyone has been waiting for, the cost of remdesivir. Gilead set the wholesale acquisition costs for remdesivir at $3,120 per five-day treatment course 
That's an average cost of $624 per day. Keep in mind that this amount will double to a cost of over $6,000 if the patient is treated for a 10-day course. Now on to the final summary and conclusion. Is remdesivir worth it? Remdesivir has not been found to be the magic bullet that cures COVID-19. In fact, it provides only a modest effect on outcomes. The greatest benefit of remdesivir seems to occur in a subgroup of patients who are receiving oxygen or are about to need oxygen by preventing the progression of the disease and the need for more therapeutic interventions. Remdesivir does not appear to show any benefit in patients with treatment courses lasting over five days or for patients initially requiring mechanical ventilation. Remdesivir has an expensive price tag of over $3,000 and twice the cost if therapy extends to 10 days. Insurers will need to develop appropriate prior authorization criteria in order to properly authorize reimbursement. Additional studies are needed to identify which types of patients benefit the most from the use of remdesivir. Future consideration should be made to identify drugs that prevent attachment of the coronavirus spike to the human cell. Finally, because the pathogenesis of COVID-19 involves immunomodulation and the inflammatory process, future studies of cytokines, interleukin-6, C-reactive protein, and other biologic markers are necessary in order to develop future therapies. So is remdesivir worth it? Well, I've given you a lot of information, but everyone needs to come up with their own decision. And while you're here, please take a look at some of the other videos on the Farm Easy Tutor channel. Thanks for tuning in to watch this episode of the Farm Easy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you would like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube and to stay informed of when the latest material is available to you, please click on the subscribe button below. We've got a lot in store at the Farm Easy Tutor channel. In addition to a four-part series on antibiotics, there will be upcoming talks on cardiac vasoactive drips, pharmacokinetic dosing, treatment of multidrug resistant organisms, TPN, and much more. So please stay tuned to us. And regularly check the description and comment section below for links to updated information regarding the most current issues surrounding remdesivir, including additional data on the Simple Severe study, the World Health Organization's Solidarity Trial, and the FDA Emergency Use Authorization to expand the use of remdesivir to other pediatric patients. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.